One of the great revelations of the age of space exploration is the image of the Earth, finite and lonely, somehow vulnerable, bearing the entire human species through the oceans of space and time. Here we are on a planet which is about 5,000 million years old. The sun around which it goes is not much older. It is part of a galaxy which is uh, perhaps uh, 10 or 12,000 million years old, which is one of perhaps hundreds of thousands of millions of other galaxies. Humans have been on this planet for something like a million years. And for the vast bulk of that time, things change extremely slowly. The population increased very slowly. Our technology increased, improved, but by very slow steps. And just recently, we had a huge increase. You know, this is what's called an exponential. It's flat for a long time, and then, boom! Increase in population, increase in technology, increase in pollution, increase in our powers to disturb the environment, to change the planetary environment. But we're the same old human beings uh, as, as we were a thousand years ago and a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, not much has changed with us. And so it's very hard for us to catch on that, uh, that there's a new situation and we have to adapt to it. On the other hand, that's one thing we humans are good at, uh, adapting, figuring out. Uh, uh, we're smart. That's our principal advantage over all the other species. I mean, we're not faster, stronger, better diggers. We don't fly all by ourselves. Uh, what we do is figure out and build because of our, our hands. The ancient mythmakers knew we're children equally of the earth and the sky. In our tenure on this planet, we've accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. But we've also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great, soaring, passionate intelligence, the clear tools for our continued survival and prosperity. Our, uh, our ability uh, to uh, understand things instantly, uh, so-called common sense, derives from a certain range of uh, size and speed and duration uh, that are appropriate for human existence. We know about things from a tenth of a millimeter to a few kilometers, uh, from a fraction of a second to a, to a lifetime. Uh, and so on. So when we are dealing with uh, matters of quantum physics where uh, uh, particles have a size of 10 to the minus 13th centimeters or uh, in cosmology where, uh, where we are talking about uh, uh, 10 billion light years or more, it is very reasonable that our uh, intuition is not adequate to the task. Fundamental Changes in society are sometimes labeled uh, impractical or contrary to human nature, as if there were only one human nature. But fundamental changes can clearly be made. We're surrounded by them. In the last two centuries, abject slavery, which was with us for thousands of years, has almost entirely been eliminated in a stirring worldwide revolution. Women systematically mistreated for millennia are gradually gaining the political and economic power traditionally denied to them. And some wars of aggression have recently been stopped or curtailed because of a revulsion felt by the people in the aggressor nations. If a five or six year old uh, asks why uh, the moon is round or why grass is green, the usual adult answer, at least in my experience, is to discourage the child. Say, what, uh, what shape did you expect the moon to be? Square? Or what color did you expect the grass to be? Blue? Uh, instead of saying that uh, those are interesting questions, let's try to find out the answer, or maybe nobody knows the answer, and, uh, and when you grow up, you'll be able to discover the answer. It would be very healthy for the human species if uh, there were less discouragement and more scientists. It's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, New Age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've been 
we live in human, but we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress? But there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson laid great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. The global balance of terror pioneered by the United States and the Soviet Union holds hostage all the citizens of the earth. Each side persistently probes the limits of the other's tolerance, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the testing of anti-satellite weapons, the Vietnam and Afghanistan wars. The hostile military establishments are locked in some ghastly mutual embrace. Each needs the other. But the balance of terror is a delicate balance, with very little margin for miscalculation. And the world impoverishes itself by spending a trillion dollars a year on preparations for war and by employing perhaps half the scientists and high technologists on the planet in military endeavors. We have let all sorts of social programs languish as we have permitted uh, uh, the amount of poverty in children to increase. Before the end of this century, more than half the kids in America may be below the poverty line. What kind of a future do we build for the country if we raise all these kids as disadvantaged, as unable to cope with the society, as resentful for the injustice served up to them? This is stupid. And then what happened with the resources is they, they went into increasing uh, budgets for arms. Isn't that where the money went? That and making rich people richer. The money all gets reinvested. If you've got money, you put it in the bank. The bank runs it out to uh, people to buy homes or cars or whatever. But not, gets people. But not poor people. Well, that's a good deal. It tends to stay up at that highly stratified, very... More people get employed with capital uh, formation. But I believe that the government has a responsibility to care for the people. I'm not talking about dole. I'm talking about making people self-reliant. People able to take care of themselves. There are countries which are perfectly able to do that. The United States is an extremely rich country. It's perfectly able to do that. It chooses not to. It chooses to have homeless people. And uh, this country has vast wealth. You just look at what something like uh, Star Wars, the money spent on Star Wars, you've already spent $20 billion on it. If these guys are permitted to go ahead, they will spend a trillion dollars on Star Wars. Think of what that money could be used for to educate, to help, to bring people up to a sense of, of uh, self-confidence. We are using money for the wrong stuff. So that's another uh, calibration of how serious the stakes are these days, how high the stakes are, putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere promises, if that's the right word, uh, a global catastrophe. In, in the particular field that, I, uh, that I'm involved with, uh, the exploration of planets, uh, there we have opened up a, a universe of wonders. We have looked close up 
at uh, dozens of new worlds, worlds that we never saw before. When you study these other worlds, you learn about this one. It's a very important fact. By comparing our world with other worlds, you can see a lot of things that can go wrong. Venus, for example, has this immense greenhouse effect. Surface temperature is hot enough to melt uh, tin or lead. Anybody who says the greenhouse effect is, uh, is just some fantasy, all I have to do is look at Venus, a very important object lesson. Uh, you put gases like carbon dioxide or CFCs, other greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere over this country, they don't stay over that country. The, those molecules don't have passports. They don't know about national sovereignty. That's something they never heard of. The atmospheric circulation spreads those gases all over the planet. And so what one country does affects all the other countries. That's serious stuff. The depletion of the ozone layer lets more ultraviolet light from the sun down to the surface of the earth. Skin cancer is a serious consequence, but the more serious aspect of it is that the ultraviolet light attacks the, the little one-celled plants that are at the base of the food chain. You know, those are the guys that the next guys eat, and the next guys, the next guys, and way up at the top of that ecological pyramid, there is us. And we're ultimately eating the one-celled plants that have been processed through lots of intermediate uh, plants and animals. And it's, it's clear, it's very thin atmosphere. It's so sensitive to the depredations of human beings. You look at that and you say, hey, that's only one little world. We don't have anywhere else to go. No other planet in the solar system is a suitable home for human beings. It's this world or nothing. That's a very powerful perception. And uh, so again, we're messing around with uh, the global environment in a very serious, very stupid way. And uh, we just have to get our technology in hand. It's not enough to say that, uh, that uh, corporations can do whatever they want as long as they make a profit, not if they're putting at risk people all over the world. They can't. There has to be a new way of approaching this. And we can't say that one nation can do what it wants within its borders. Because as I said before, what you do in one country's borders has consequences all over the planet. The solution to these kinds of problems has to be that everybody on Earth works together. And so uh, I think there's uh, certainly a chance of getting out of this mess, but not by business as usual, not by the idea that, uh, that we shouldn't plan ahead, not by the idea that anybody can do whatever the hell they want and uh, it doesn't uh, affect the environment. So there has to be a new way of looking at the future, and that is that we're all humans, members of the same species, on one fragile little planet. We're all in this together, and we have to work together. Uh, that's kind of the silver lining of these crises. They are forcing us to become a planetary species. Which aspects of our nature will prevail is uncertain, particularly when our visions and prospects are bound to one small part of the small planet Earth. But up there in the cosmos, an inescapable perspective awaits. National boundaries are not evident when we view the Earth from space. Fanatic ethnic or religious or national identifications are a little difficult to support when we see our planet as a fragile blue crescent fading to become an inconspicuous point of light against the bastion and citadel of the stars. The old appeals to racial, sexual, religious chauvinism and to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the Earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. How would we explain all this to a dispassionate extraterrestrial observer? What account would we give of our stewardship of the planet Earth? We have heard the rationales offered by the superpowers. We know who speaks for the nations, but who speaks for the human species? Who speaks for Earth? From an extraterrestrial perspective, our global civilization is clearly on the edge of failure in the most important task it faces, preserving the lives and well-being of its citizens and the future habitability of the planet. Here we face a critical branch point in history. What we do with our world right now will propagate down through the centuries and powerfully affect the destiny of our descendants. It is well within our power to 
destroy our civilization and perhaps our species as well. If we capitulate to superstition or greed or stupidity, we can plunge our world into a darkness deeper than the time between the collapse of classical civilization and the Italian Renaissance. But we are also capable of using our compassion and our intelligence, our technology and our wealth to make an abundant and meaningful life for every inhabitant of this planet, to enhance enormously our understanding of the universe and to carry us to the stars.